Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here today for our panel, Government Policies in New America. I'm Steve Klemensik, the Managing Director and Partner at Berkeley Research Group, where I lead the firm's practice centered around the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, better known as CFIUS, and I'll be your moderator for this session. In 1966, Robert F. Kennedy, in a speech in Cape Town, South Africa, said, quote, there is a Chinese curse which says, may he live in interesting times. Like it or not, we live in interesting times. There are times of danger and uncertainty, but they're also more open to the creative energy of men than any other time in history, unquote. We can argue whether this is actually a Chinese curse, but the sentiment is as real today as it was 55 years ago. And we're certainly in interesting times. Around the world, there is social unrest, a global pandemic, inequality, repression, wars, starvation, and climate change with global implications. In the United States, we have not seen social unrest on this scale since the late 60s and early 70s. Yet the one entity that is capable of leading the country out of this miasma of uncertainty in, in some cases and fear in others is the U.S. government, and it's largely unable to bring about needed change. Mired over the past several years in growing hyperpartisanship and what is perceived to be an inability to work for the common good, the U.S. government suffers from a loss of trust from the people who elected it to serve. This is not a recent phenomenon, but one that has been growing for years. So we are left to ponder, what are we going to do and who's going to do it? Our panel today is going to address some of the issues we face. What actions can the new administration take to regain trust? What aspects of society need social and financial capital to rebuild the American way? And at a very fundamental level, how will education policy and workplace diversity be addressed? Our panel is well suited to offer its opinion on these critical matters. Each panelist is highly successful in their respective fields, and we're grateful to have their participation. I'm joined today by Michael D. Brown, United States Shadow Senator from the District of Columbia. Joe Jorgensen, Libertarian Presidential Candidate in the 2020 U.S. election. Joel Moser, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, Aquamarine Investment Partners. And two members who should be joining us in progress, uh, Michael Johnston, who's a member of the board of the Capital Group Companies, and Gligor Tashkovich, former Minister for Foreign Investment in North Macedonia. So we begin with the idea of trust. So why is public trust in government at record lows? I'd be curious to hear your views, Joe Jorgensen, on this topic, and, and how, how is it this can be made better? Well, you have to look at what causes distrust. Uh, obviously, dishonesty does. So we have to look and say, okay, are people in government or people in education, are they dishonest? And looking at Congress, a lot of people say, yes, Congress, Congress people are dishonest, but many would argue that they were much more dishonest in the 1930s and 1940s. They were doing backroom deals all the time. So what's different now? And I would suggest that what's different now is we're basically doing everything through government, whether it's education, whether it's your retirement, health care, whatever. So back in the 1930s and 40s, Congressmen could be as dishonest as they wanted, and people didn't care because it didn't affect their everyday lives. But now it affects our everyday lives, and so now people care. And I would like to ask a question regarding education. What would it be like if we all got together and voted on whether or not we should all be vegetarians? You know, let's take a vote. 51% or more wins, we're going to be vegetarians or we're going to eat meat. And that's exactly what we're doing for education. So let's say you want prayer in your school. What you have to do is you have to support a candidate, donate money, put out signs, get your friends to vote, go out and vote for that person. Let's say your neighbor doesn't want prayer in school. Your neighbor does the opposite comes up with a different candidate, gets his friends to vote, puts out signs, and one of you is going to lose and one of you is going to win, and the loser is going to have to follow the lead of the winner. What we need in education is innovation, and we need choice, not the kind of phony Republican choice we keep hearing about, but actual choice where people get to uh, educate their children how they want to. Okay. We will have we'll have a a significant piece of discussion about education policy here shortly. So hang on to that thought. Uh, Minister Taskovich, why, in your mind, why is public trust in government at record lows? Hmm. Um, I think it comes down to three, three major issues. Um, partisan gerrymandering, the politicization of, of news, the inability of people to be able to tell fact from opinion, 
um, and the shift in the principles of the Republican Party over the last decade, starting with um, the emergence of the Tea Party. Okay. Just need a constructive opposition, and they don't have it. Okay. Senator Brown, in your view, what are the systemic changes that need to be made to instill a renewed sense of trust in the government? Well, I think, you know, uh, government needs to produce. So the first thing you need to do is get rid of the old Jim Crow uh, filibuster. That needs to go. I mean, if we need, uh, if we're going to be deadlocked in Congress, nothing's going to get done, then people aren't going to trust uh, the government. You need to, we need to move things forward. So that's one of the systemic changes that needs to be made. And I think another thing that needs to be done is you need to get rid of the electoral college. The electoral college is a, a, a political anachronism, which may have served a purpose at one time to bring equality to states that uh, weren't adequately represented. But the popular vote is what should determine uh, uh, who wins an election. And I think right. we must believe that. So there are two major changes that need to be made. It's not likely that either one of them is going to happen anytime soon, but I think we need to push in that direction. Okay. Joel, your thoughts on, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Minister, yeah. Minister you had something? Well, could, do we get to respond to each other? We, we can certainly jump in if you have something to okay. add. Yeah, I do have two important points I'd like to make. First of all, somebody just said the popular vote. So again, my question is, should we all get together and vote on whether we're going to be vegetarians or whether we're going to eat meat? I mean, we cannot live in a free society that way. And the second question is, somebody said uh, government needs to produce. Government doesn't produce anything. It takes money from people and it uses uses it much more inefficiently than the free market would. And you said we're going to talk about education. Just look at the price of education. It costs more to educate people in students in public schools, government run public schools, than in private education. So I don't see government producing anything. Okay. Well, I would only say to that 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 belies our history. You know, people coming back from the Second World War would tell you that government produced a lot when they educated uh, GIs and they passed the GI Bill and they made home ownership possible for millions of Americans that didn't other have it. They, I agree with you that uh, uh, business works more efficiently, but we've seen the business model. And if we leave it to business, there's only going to be two businesses left in the United States soon, and that'll be Walmart and Amazon. They're, you know, I completely government has an important role. No, it's government who's giving us these large corporations. How do large corporations get their power? They get it by giving donations, campaign contributions to Congress people. And look at Amazon. They go where the cities give them tax breaks. If we didn't have government giving these large corporations advantages, then mom and pop stores could so much better compete against them. That's not Minister, right. you, Minister you had a point? Yes, yeah, Senator Brown, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, so we could agree that electoral college is an anachronism, but it would require a constitution. Uh oh, uh oh, he just froze. Okay, um, Joel, your thoughts on trust in government? It's an interesting point that Joe made that people in government have been corrupt for as far back as we can remember. That's, I believe, true. Uh, there's a difference, which is we, we get to watch them a little bit closer now um, because of um, increased, the increased information technology. Um, more people are paying more attention in a way. But that's no excuse. It's no excuse to say, well, they've always been corrupt, so why are we holding them to a higher standard? I think that the standard has evolved. I think that you know there are issues about um, the way uh, some of the, you know, this last election, um, attempts by followers of the former president to uh, corrupt the election process. And it's fair point that it's not the first time it's happened. But one would like to think, I would like to think, that there's an evolving standard, there's an evolving ethical standard. We're not as bad as we used to be. We should be better. And we see how bad it is, and people don't trust how government performs when they see 
how bad it's performing at a political level. I think that there is a, there's a role that government has to play. I, I find that libertarianism has an appeal. Um, it has it had an intellectual appeal to me when I was, a, I was in college. Um, I think that there, but there is an important role in government that government can play in many things that are pressing now. And uh, Steve, I think we'll get to some of these issues around climate change and the economic recovery. But that's my thought about uh, trust in government. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Senator Brown, I'd like to uh, continue with you on this topic of trust in the government. Um, you, you have a kind of a unique position here. Uh, we're bipartisanship in Washington, according to nearly all press reporting and some members of Congress, is either dead or the next worst thing to original sin. So how do we remove the barriers to bipartisanship? Well, that's a really, really tough question because – uh, you know, the, uh, we're deadlocked now, uh, and, uh, I think that one thing, one, one barrier again that needs to be removed is a filibuster because, uh, then, uh, we can move things forward and, uh, as we progress, that will engender more bipartisanship. But right now, uh, you know, as was already pointed out, uh, money in politics, and also, you know, the real capital of politics is votes. Uh, and as long as uh, these people are playing to the crowd, uh, they're going to to their own crowds. We need to bring the country together in order to uh, get get bipartisan back on bipartisanship back on track. You know, we used to have a set of values as Americans that you know there was a thing called being American. And those values have changed dramatically. And we need to come to common ground again in order to force our politicians to do the same. You know, lock into our common interests. We all care about our children. We all care about education. We, there are common bonds that, that bring us all together. And we need to, uh, I think, do things that engender the... Um, you know, the, the facilitation of those things in order to get our politicians to move. You know, we still, politics is, is, is a dirty business and always has been, but we still only have 50% of the people in America that vote. Half of us don't even vote. Oh, do you mind if I jump in? Registered right? voters. Okay. Do you mind if I jump in? Certainly. I I got to say, I couldn't agree with you more that politics is a dirty business, which is why we need to reduce the size and scope. And your original question was, how do we remove the barrier of uh, bipartisanship? The only, the only way, the only way to do that is by taking power out of their hands. And absolutely, we used to have values that were a bit more monochrome, let's say. We, you know, we had formed Judeo Christian society. Pretty much everybody, uh, went along the same, but we, we, our country discriminated against blacks, discriminated against um, gay people. Discrim and so there was like one view. But now that these people have their voices, now that we realize that we have differences, that yes, there are Muslims in the country and they should be able to practice their religion. And yes, we have atheists and we have all these other people. So one size fits all now, you know, first of all, one size fits all never really did fit, but it sure fit a lot better a hundred years ago than it does now. And it's not going to fit now. So the only way to get that out of, you know, out of where we are is to give the choice to the people and stop asking a few hundred people in Washington to make decisions for the hundreds of millions of the rest of us. Okay. So on, on, on that note, let's talk about education policy for a minute. That seems to be something we'd like to get into. So, Minister Taskovich, while it's generally accepted that education is a state and local issue, is there a role for the federal government and what would you suggest? Um, so here I should have disagree with uh, Ms. Jorgensen. Sorry, that's me. Yeah, D Dr. Jorgensen, thank you. Dr. Jorgensen, thank you. Um, uh, you know, anything that's not in the Constitution is remanded to the states. And I'm just going on my own experience because that's what I have to base this on, right? I grew up in New York State. I went to public high school, K to, public school K to 12. Uh, if people in my community wanted to go to private school and they could afford it, they went. 
people wanted to go to St. Patrick's, which is a you know religious Catholic school. They went. Um, buses picked up all the kids from everywhere, so it didn't matter where you got off the bus. But um, so that the, the, the government, I guess, covered the the bus system. But um, that wasn't an issue, and I'm not sure why it's an issue today. It wasn't then. Okay. So Joel Moser, is there room for growth in education policy aligned with the changing world? And are there experiences you can share for your work at Columbia that can apply generally? Sure. Uh, so my main job is I'm the CEO of Aquamarine Investment Partners. We are an energy transition investor, but I've been privileged for about a decade to be an adjunct professor at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, where I teach infrastructure development. And I'm a founding uh, board member and executive committee member of the Energy Policy Center at Columbia. Uh, the Energy Policy Center has just been, um, it's announced that it will be part of the newly created Climate School at Columbia. So this is the first time in 25 years that Columbia University, a private university, established before the United States, established in 1754, entirely private university, has created a new school, and it's the Climate School. It's about all the things that go around climate change. So it will include the Energy Center, Energy Policy, it will include the Earth Institute, Sustainability, it will include the Lamont Dowdy Observatory, which is about Earth science. And they are creating an entirely new um, kind of academics around a changing world. Um, the university, this is in alignment with a policy that the university president established called the Fourth Purpose. So universities historically had a variety of purposes, training in religion, history, the classics, um, the uh, um, a research institute. So his concept and the concept that the climate school is created around is that universities must have a fourth purpose, and that is to affect change, to, to accelerate the timeline from which academics can cause and, and, and affect real, real change for humanity. So this is a good example of this is in um, health science. So it's all great that there are scientists coming up with, with new ideas for new drugs, but if we can include their work in a collaboration with the private sector and with the nonprofit sector to accelerate from, you know, from 10 years to say four years, how soon that science has an impact on humanity, we've, we've made a real impact. Similarly, around climate, an issue that faces the whole world that will affect ultimately everything we do in a way it, 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 and it already is affecting much of much of what we do there's a lot of good thinking around policy which goes to government and I want to want to talk to 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 Joe a little bit about that um, but also around the sustainability and design which is across the public and private sector as well as the nonprofit sector to get these ideas out there fast enough to make a difference because when it comes to climate change speed is critical. So there's a lot that education can do. Um, broadening that a little bit, you know, beyond, you know, beyond the hallowed halls of, of an Ivy League university, uh, this kind of transformation in education will affect the workforce, that the workforce of the future will have jobs in climate change. Uh, so in the same way that um, when I was a young person, I went to a public high school in New York as well, um, I was still part of uh, you know, the, the students who were learning science because of the uh, President Kennedy's um, um, you know, uh, space, space race. Well, there needs to be a climate race, um, and we need to be teaching the industries of the future, um, renewable energy and alternative fuels and sustainability, uh, right, right from the beginning so that, so that young people growing up will, will be ready Academically, to pursue careers, whether at the, whether you know as as geological scientists, climate scientists, or uh, drillers doing carbon capture um, from one end to the other around what will be the industries of the future. So I think that there's a, there's a, there's an opportunity for a transformational change in the way education policy happens around this one specific issue. You know, can I just add to that that you know I think we should hit the nail on the head and it's up to government to set those priorities because left to business let you know what you get is fracking and clean coal 
and more oil. Uh, yeah, I ran a business for 25 years, and the mantra for business is in the long run, we're all dead. We're always worried about the media. And so to have the perspective to set the priorities that Joel is talking about, I think you have to rely on government to do that. Go ahead, but then I want to follow up, if I may. Well, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I, I agree, and I agree with, what I think, Joe, what you're about to say. I think that some of each, I am not a libertarian, although, as I said before, I, the libertarian principles have an intellectual appeal. I think there's, there's a balance. So what's interesting, Senator, is that um, in the last four years, as the United States lagged the rest of the world in addressing climate change since it withdrew from the Paris Agreement, Nonetheless, the world moved forward. Right. But it wasn't just about the things that were happening in the EU, although it was. It was things that the private sector was doing, shockingly, I know, on its own, driven by um, lenders, investors, consumers. So I agree that the, 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 the primary motivation of business is a profit motive, right. but there are profit motive driven factors that have led business. So in a way, business are, I wouldn't say they're the leaders, they're among the leaders in the climate conversation and are making changes. At the same time, government has to play a role. Government has to play a big role. And let me just give you one, one, one um, data point. It came out, I think yesterday, the day before, that during the, uh, the depths of the pandemic, when large sectors of our economy were shut down, the amount of carbon emissions worldwide was reduced only by 6%. So what this means is that there is a very severe limit on individual action to affect climate change. To address climate change requires not just one individual or one company or one country, it's global action. Most of the countries in the entire world need to take action. The U.S. must lead that. The U.S. is a big, a big part of that. And that's going to require government policy, government investment. Just as a very specific example, one way to reduce carbon emissions is to get people on mass transit. Well, only government can do mass transit. I, as an individual, can't build a new subway line. Only government can. And in fact, using New York as an example, it's not, not even the city can do it. The city needs the state, needs the federal government. Government needs to play a, a, criti a critical role. So it's both the private sector and the public sector working together. It's got to be a balance. Okay. So, Senator Brown, with respect to the education system in America. Well, wait, could I, could I jump in? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Jones. I was going to jump in earlier, and then I said, sure, take your response. Uh, full disclosure, I am an educator. I teach at Clemson University. Uh, I'm not here on behalf of Clemson, however, although they haven't fired me yet for uh, going around the country talking about this. But I want to go back to the root here because, you know, so far the discussion has been on – uh, college, but we got to go back to the beginning of education. And I can tell you as an educator, you know, every year I review textbooks uh, or I'm given textbooks to review to see if I want to change the textbook in my class. And pretty much every new edition that comes out says, well, we've reduced the reading level. You know, now students are reading at a lower level. So we can't wait until college. We got to start earlier. And the only way to get better anything is through innovation through competition. And the example I give, I mean, look at how much education has changed, you know, over the last um, hundred years, not a whole lot. I mean, I'm pretty much teaching the way, you know, they taught a hundred years ago, but look at computers. The part of the reason that we have such wonderful technology is Steve Jobs and Bill Gates hated each other and they wanted to outdo the other. They wanted to have their products product to be faster, uh, cheaper, in more hands than the other person. And so they had innovation. And you look at the last, you know, what I would call major innovation, let's say in earlier schooling, and one of the examples would be Montessori schools. And what happened there, if you don't know the story about Montessori schools, is back in Italy, they, they gave 
Dr. Maria Montessori, basically the poor section of town, because it was like, well, let's give it to the woman. You know, she can't do anything anyway. And so working with the most disadvantaged students, she was able to come up with a huge increase. And, you know, now we're still using many of those techniques. So instead of having a monopolistic system, which, by the way, you know, I, I know some of you from your discussion, it sounded like you're from the Democratic Party. Democrats hate monopolies. Well, why do you like monopolies when it comes to education? Wouldn't it be great if we had the same competition and innovation and lack of a monopoly in education that we had computers and technology that gave us all of those good things and let different, uh, different school systems come out and compete for the best system? We would see so much more innovation than what we have right now with a government-run monopoly. You know, again... All I can say about uh, allowing localities to decide on these things, we see it. Uh, we no, see no, but go ahead, but go ahead, but no. Okay, go ahead. we see the desperate uh, uh, impact of, uh, you know, the school system in Mississippi and New York are totally different. Okay, so, uh, and Bill Gates may have, you know, made the computer popular, but it was the government to set up the internet, and it was the government that allowed uh, the framework that's allowed us to, 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 to uh, expand the way we have in terms of uh, global understanding through, through the use of computers. But I agree, education needs to change. You know, uh, I went to a liberal arts college. None of the things that you just mentioned existed when I was in college. There were, there was one big computer for the whole college. Nobody ever had a cell phone. Nobody, you know, there was no internet. Uh, so education needs to change. But I think some of the problem with it is the parochial nature of having locale, you know, not having the federal government set standards, not, you know, not yeah. make monopoly, but set standards. Well, no, I mean, and, and one thing that I said in pretty much every campaign stop was the needs of rural Appalachia much different than the needs of downtown Manhattan. We should not have one uh, Department of Education setting standards for everybody because there are different needs everywhere. And you said about the locales competing. No, I'm, I'm saying an even smaller group. Rather than having Mississippi do it one way, I'm saying you've got, you know, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, whatever, and you've got three or four different schools competing, just like McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's competed, just like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates competed. That's what we need. Okay. Minister Baskovich, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Oh, I was just leaving a message for, for the senator, but, but just to say that I was actually part of the team that built the internet back in the 80s before Senator Gore uh, legitimized it by passing some legislation. Right. Okay. Okay, so we, we, we pounded on education a bit. Now I'd like to turn to, to turn to workplace diversity. So, Joel, how can investment happen now? The ha that's happening now as part of the effort to recover from the pandemic, as well as the move to realign the economy, address basic issues, lack of diversity in the workplace. Yeah, and as I speak, and I and I'm I'm terrible with names, so I've been calling Senator. I think it's Mike Brown, Senator, and Doctor Tony uh, your Doctor, and then I've got the Minister, and then Steve. You have a you have a, a military. You where the, what do I call you? I'm Admiral. Retired, I'm retired Navy, but I don't go by that anymore. That was a while ago. So. Okay, I, I don't have a t I guess you can call me a professor, but that's yeah, all right. Whatever. I don't like <laughs> I'm not um, a professor, I'm a lecturer, so. But, but you can give me a promotion and call me professor if you like. <laughs> well, um, I have some thoughts about recovery, as you might might uh, not be surprised to hear, around decarbonization. And yes, uh, yes, doctor, you are, you're correct, I am a Democrat. So I, I'm a big fan of the new president. I thought the Build Back Better um, um, rhetoric was good. Um, I think one way to think of it, though, is build back uh, differently. Um, we we don't want to rebuild and have the exactly the same economy as we had before the pandemic, because the economy we had before the pandemic was leading us in the wrong direction. Again, I'm going to focus a little bit about about climate change with the with the dollars that that potentially can be capitalized around recovery. We have and I. I think whether you call it once in a generation or once in a multi-generation opportunity to reshape 
the economy. And I know the private sector is going to have to do a lot of that, but the major changes that have to happen around that are going to be set by policies and dollars, dollars put out by the federal government. So what are we talking about? We're talking about being able to move significant amounts of renewable energy around the country on a smart, on a smart grid so that we can include, increase our efficiency and optimize our use of renewable energy. We're talking about using renewable fuels for long haul transportation like um, transoceanic voyages, uh, air travel, heavy truck travel. So we're talking about hydrogen based fuels. So we're talking about policies to encourage the production and distribution of a, of a form of energy, which has never been used this way really in any, on any commercial scale. Um, we're talking about significant carbon capture projects, which have, there are a few, but not, but, but not, not enough to make a significant difference, both for industrial use and for direct air carbon capture. So what does all this mean? These are new industries. So these are new jobs. And we're talking about new job training. So how do we do that? How do we introduce diversity into the workforce? The answer is we're talking about entirely new categories of, of workers. And I think you're right. We can start this education in the lower grades. If I can plug the university again at the, at the, at the uh, Energy Institute of Columbia, we have something called the Women's Energy Initiative, where we're trying to foster, trying to create job opportunities for women coming up through the School of International Affairs in the energy industry. The energy industry of the future is not going to be about guys on oil rigs, although it never needed to be guys. It could have been gals on oil rigs, but that's, that's not what's going to be happening. We're talking about soil engineers and deep ground geologists. We're talking about engineers in, in fuels, biofuels, in all kinds of, and again, from one end of the spectrum to the other, from, from blue collar to highly, highly, highly trained uh, scientists, we can diversify the workforce because we're going to have a new workforce. I think it's important to, to find roles for the existing workforce, which is aging out. And I think the idea of using coal, coal miners to cap and close uh, uh, wells that are, that are spewing gas, that are just left abandoned, um, is a good idea. But the next economy is going to be a decarbonization economy, and we're going to have entirely new uh, kinds of jobs, and these can be diverse jobs from every respect. Okay. Senator Brown, um, there's often discussion around the use of quotas versus standards in achieving a diverse workforce. What do you believe is the best path to bring about diversity and inclusion in the workplace? Well, I think it's standard. I, it's standards. I think we've tried quotas. I think we've tried busing. We've tried many, many different uh, things that haven't worked. And I think that, uh, as the doctor points out, education, we need to start earlier. We need to bus resources and not, and not students. You know, we need to, every kid in America should be able to go to a community college and uh, do that for free. They should get their first three, two years. And those colleges should be oriented towards, uh, uh practical skills as well as liberal education. You know, I can tell you from my my experience, uh, I'm an orphan who dropped out of high school and have a master's degree because I was able to go to a community college where I could pay $20 a credit hour and put myself through school to get a degree that led me to a four-year university and undergraduate school. So I think that we need to set, we need to the government, the government's role in this is to set and not quotas uh, to uh, give resources to wh wh where they're most needed and to set a new a new set of priorities, as Joel again points out. You know, to a different uh, for a different end. I think quotas quotas are easy enough to get around. We they've never really worked. They've never. Worked. Okay. Can I, can I jump in and respond to some of this? Sure. Uh, yeah, so you just uh, you know talked about going to community college and paying $20 a credit. Again, if we had competition the way we have in computers, prices would go down. So you've got to ask yourself, first of all, why are prices as high as they are in college? 
And I would say the major cause is the federal government loan program, because any economist will tell you, you flood the market with money and now they're going to raise their prices. And and it, it's just very clear that once there was plenty of money to go around, colleges started raising their prices. So again, look at how expensive computers were in the 1970s, 1980s, and how cheap they are now. It's because you had competition. So why not have competition in something that's even more important, which is education. And somebody said earlier about uh, the economy, about the government uh, directing the economy. And as somebody who, and, and by the way, I, I grew up in a small town. I literally cut through a cornfield to go to school. I was taught old values of America. And what my fifth grade teacher taught us was the reason that America works and the uh, Soviet Union didn't is that we had the free market and they said for instance take steel in the in the Soviet Union you had a group of people deciding okay should we put steel towards refrigerators or should we put them towards coal or should we put them wherever whereas in the United States we've got a price system if there aren't enough cars to go around then people making cars will be willing to pay more for the steel uh, if there aren't enough refrigerators then that's where the money is going to go so basically in our country we're voting with our dollars. We're voting with our feet. With our dollars, we're saying, no, I, I, I would rather have steel go towards a car because I want a car. So this idea of a planned economy, first of all, it's not the America I grew up in, which is just tragic because that's how we beat the Soviet Union. But secondly, it doesn't work. If, if a planned economy worked, then the Soviet Union would have worked and the it, then the economy failed. And also, just look at it from a practical standpoint. Okay, if you're talking about de uh, you know, de running the economy, do you really want lumbering, inefficient government entities like the DMV or you know the VA hospital system, whatever? Do you want those guys to be in charge of our economy? Or do you want people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs who are always, you know, click, 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 trying to... Um, go to the next best thing, trying to outdo the other person. I would suggest that individuals working in our country can do a much better job. And now we have more diversity to do that. And by the way, you're right, quotas, uh, I mean, part of the reason that we had to have quotas, I'd like to remind you, is that it was the federal government who discriminated against people. That the uh, in the free market, you could never discriminate the way the federal government did. Uh, for instance, excuse me, doctor, that's just not true. Well, no let me think. Talking no about, no example, talking let me about the economy, first no, of all, and no, in the no. America that you grew up in, 75% of women were found in five professions. Five professions. And that wasn't because of the government. That was because of business, okay? The union movement, all these things. The union government, movement. Government has, a, has a, a place. It's not to plan the economy. It's not, but it's to, it's to promote the general welfare, which no business will do beyond its profit margin. And that's just our history. Well, somebody else said about, about the uh, go government, it wasn't you, somebody else said something about planning the economy. No, but let me back up. Rosa Parks, who was told to sit in the back of the bus, what they don't tell us is that was a government-owned, government-run bus, and 60% of the bus ridership were blacks, and that's how the government treated them, and they could get away with it because they were a government-run monopoly. What if Uber or Lyft discriminated against the best 60% of their customers? They would go out of business as well they should. Only the government can get away with these things scot-free because they don't have the market uh, to put them back into place. So I'm going to ask one question here. I, 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 I have a question in Alabama. That's not the truth. It's just not the truth. Okay. I have a question for Dr. Jordan here. Now, yet, I, I don't disagree with a lot of the points you're raising, but I, I, would, ask, I would ask this. If the government is, is the, the boogeyman in this, for lack of a better term, it was the government that directed the integration of the military. Wait, but you, you're not going back far enough. It was the government after they freed the slaves. So what happened after they freed the slaves is for the first 10 years, the free 
slaves were doing great. Why? Because they were skilled craftsmen. They were very good at their work because they were the ones doing the work. And so starting a new business, they offered a lower price, which by the way, is what I did when I started my business. I offered a lower price to attract customers. So what happened was for 10 years, the blacks were doing great, offering great quality at lower prices. And the whites said, oh, what can we do now to compete? So they had the power. And instead of Instead of saying, well, I guess we'll just have to lower our prices too, they instead got the power of government behind them. We got Jim Crow laws. We got people who you had to have a specific reading level for a job that had nothing to do with, with reading. And so, you know, my question is, you said the government integrated the army. Why wasn't it integrated from the beginning? It's because that's the way things were run. And it's only because the government had the power to do that. But I, I, would, I would offer one more point on this. It was the government that ended it. It wasn't a business that came up with the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. It wasn't a, it wasn't a business that ended slavery. The businessmen in the South wanted slavery because it supported their economy. It was the government that ended it. And that's the point. There's a role for business and there's a role for government. But the government had to end it because the government started it. And I would still point to the free market. For instance, my oh, first job after right. Hold on. My, my, first job, my first job after I got my MBA. One second, please. Working. One second. Okay. okay. Sorry. We need to we need to dial this back a minute. Yes, we do. Um, so all, all fair points and, and great food for thought. Um, Minister Tashkovich, I'd like to get your thoughts on the approach to diversity in the workplace used by by Washington or in Washington by the Democrats versus the approach used by the Republicans? Well, I mean, my general feeling about this is that Democrats seek to protect all people, no matter what their backgrounds or disabilities, um, the different types of people out there in the world. And Republicans go out of their way to discriminate. And it's true in their policies. It's true in their efforts to restrict voting. It's true in so many different facets of our life. Um, in the case of uh, workplace diversity, I don't think I think they've totally lost the mantle of um, pro business, frankly. Uh, and we can even look to see that every time a Democrat president is in power in recent history, the stock market has gone up, showing that um, Democrats are more pro business. Can I make okay. just one one quick point? You said that Democrats protect all people. I'd like to point out that as recently as 2012, both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton thought that gay marriage should be illegal. The Libertarian Party, however, since 1971, has been saying that we should have gay marriage. Okay. So now we have, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So I'd like to, there's a question that, that is bubbling around for me. And this is for all the panelists. I'd like very quickly, if you could, get your opinion in on this. One of the major topics in Washington is the new administration's infrastructure plan. Do you agree with President Biden's expanded definition of infrastructure, where it goes beyond physical infrastructure to social infrastructure? And I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Joel? Yeah, so I've been teaching a class called International Infrastructure Development and Finance at Columbia for 10 years. And I've been an infrastructure developer, financier, lawyer for 40 years. And I have to tell you, there's no more complicated topic that we can talk about forever as to about what is the word infrastructure mean. So it, frankly, it's kind of amusing for me to see this discussion being a, a national discussion. I will say I have long advocated a broader definition of infrastructure. For example, I'm, I, I wrote, a, wrote, a, wrote an article for Forbes that that museums need to be part of infrastructure because it's part of the cultural, cultural landscape of a community. Um, I think the administration is 100% correct that you need to uh, include the social safety net. There's something in the UK which likes to put labels on everything called social infrastructure, which is health care and education. It is hardly, it is hardly extraordinary or unusual to have a broader definition of infrastructure. Um, I think, you know, the whole idea of roads and bridges as infrastructure is, is about a hundred years old. In fact, if the objective is to get people out of their cars and onto mass transit, stop building roads and bridges. So uh, I'm 100% in favor of it. Senator? Yeah, I would agree hundred percent. I don't think I can say it better. I think that uh, what you 
can't envision, just to use the museum uh, uh, example, what you can't envision, you can't accomplish. So I, I agree with the broad. Dr. Jorgensen? Of course, I couldn't disagree more. Uh, I say that individuals working with each other to try to compete against each other for innovation and give the best product for the best price. Uh, again, do you want the uh, DMV, uh, the equivalent of DMVs competing with each other or the private market that's giving us such uh, great technology? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna exercise my prerogative here to go over just, just for a minute because there's a follow on question to this. Is, it, is infrastructure spending, whether it's social or both, a good way to restore public trust in the government? Joel? I think it is. And I've said several times that I think that libertarianism has an intellectual appeal. And I didn't know that we would have a libertarian on the panel, uh, which sort of frames out this discussion. But I will say that the interesting thing about this country is the balance of the private sector and government. And I think, you know, as we've seen in a robust de debate in this panel, there's lots to talk about. But the things that I do, infrastructure, need a robust government role. You, you, only the government can enter into the Paris Climate Accord. Only the government can build a subway. You don't need a subway in rural Alabama. You need subways in urban cities. Only the government can build, can build roads, can, can do all the various things that are necessary for decarbonization and even to repair the great roads and bridges which we talk about, which are in horrible, horrible condition. Yes, I think that the, the, the public sees our aging infrastructure and faults government rightly. And I think those that are forward thinking that want to see a new economy, a decarbonization economy, an economy that's for the future, is rightly looking to government to, at a minimum, set the policy. If you want to have a more libertarian approach to it, do it as carbon pricing. Let the private sector do it. That's one actually perfectly valid approach. And or actually spend the money to build some of these things. A lot of what I do is public sector infrastructure, and a lot of what I do is entirely private sector infrastructure. There's roles as roles for both, but the government must must lead in this. Okay. Minister, um, the, the question before the group here, I'm not sure if you heard it or not. No, I'm is, sorry. You can... Is infrastructure spending, whether physical, social, or both, a good way to restore public trust in government? Sorry, it was what now? Okay. Is infrastructure spending, whether physical, social, or both, a good way to restore public trust in government? It's part of the uh, part of the way to do it. it. Needs to be done differently than in the past. Um, I'm thinking about President Obama's shovel ready projects. I'm not sure they they were so successful. Um, but my thought about that really comes back to the Eisenhower interstate system and the fact that. It's need of a major overhaul for our bridges and our, our bridges in particular across the country. Um, so uh, I think I think there are ways to do it. We just have to be sure we don't fall into the uh, the pit of repeating something that we tried before and didn't work. Okay, Dr. Jorgensen. So somebody mentioned that uh, we need government to do subways and roads. Well, my question is who decides where the subways go? Who decides where the roads go? Well, it's a special interest. It's the people who have friends in Washington. And, you know, I'd like to quote Milton Friedman who said, if you build a university and you want to decide where to put the sidewalks, what you should do is the first year don't have any sidewalks at all and just see where the students walk. <laughs> and wherever their paths are, kind of that's the free market. That's where you build the sidewalk. And that's what I would like to see is individuals decide where the roads go where the subways go not the special interest and people you know you want back to the original question of why people distrust government because we all know that they're just taking care of their special interests their big corporation their corporate pals or corporate ceos and the, the the average person is sick of it the average person wants to spend their money to make their own decisions and not have people in washington make those kind of decisions for them okay senator well, I would just say that, you know, if uh, uh, politicians are corrupted by corporations, I don't see the, the value in leaving it up to corporations. And let's understand that infrastructure supports everybody, right? The auto industry only grew because we built highways across America. There would be no airline industry if the government hadn't built airports. So they both have, they both have roles. I'm not saying to exclude the government, I mean, to exclude business, but 
Uh, we both have appropriate roles. And I think, yes, infrastructure is very important because it's tangible. It's something that people see. And we take uh, a great pride in, in, in a lot of what the government has done through infrastructure. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, just look, excuse me, just look at NASA, for example, how much pride the space program has brought and how much industry it's brought, you know, billions in industry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't disagree more. I mean, just look at the travel industry. Uh, the, the, the airports would have been built because people want air travel. In fact, I live in Greenville, South Carolina. And when the BMW plant went up, they put an extension on the runway because they had to bring in the big machinery. So that's a case of, okay, we have a need for it. But look at when government decides to help their pals out. We've got bridges to nowhere, roads to nowhere. I lived in one city. I won't name the city. There was this big, huge, you know, eight lane road that pretty much went to nowhere. You know, again, somebody paying, you know, somebody uh, turning in a favor. So why not let the people decide? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. It's a very lively discussion. Lots, lots of points, yeah. counterpoints, and a lot of food for thought. So uh, I, I would like to chalk this up as a very successful meeting. And uh, thank you all for your time. And uh, by all means, if anybody needs anything, you know, we, we have the ability to contact each other. And I uh, hope everyone has a good day. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, me too. Thank you, everybody.